Hello and welcome to a new edition of the CPL Newsroom Podcast. I am Christian Jack, joined as ever by my colleagues Charlie O'Connor-Clark and Marty Thompson. We wish you all a happy new year and I hope during these difficult times you and all your families are healthy and full of love and safe. On today's show, we will recap a ton of CPL off-season news already. That's right, it's not even two weeks into January and we've got a ton of news for you, including major headlines out of Hamilton as they poach free agents Terran Campbell and Alessandro Hajabrapur from Pacific FC less than 40 days after both walked off Tim Horton's field dressed in purple as CPL champions. Later in the show, we'll be joined by both players and, of course, very soon we'll be joined on the show by Bobby Smirniotis to talk about what attracted the club to both of those players and how Forge are preparing for next month's CONCACAF Champions League last 16 tie against Mexican giants Cruz Azul. Later in the show, we'll also look back at the month that was in the CPL and look at some of the major moves happening in each market. Gentlemen... What a way to start. Last time we were talking about this show, this on this very show, was recapping a final won by a header by Alessandro Hajabapur. And here we are talking less than 40 days later about Hajabapur going back to Tim Hortons Field as a Forge FC player. Marty Thompson, how are you, my man? And how have you feel, felt about this news as you digest two players leaving one team to go to another? Uh, I'm good. I think I've texted Charlie three or four times over the last week, being like, "Is this real? I can't believe this is real." Even yes. Forge when they even when Forge when they posted uh, their little Campbell sort of sizzle reel when they cut him out from purple to orange, it was like, "What?" I, I it's it's uh, it's surreal, but I am super excited to see where this goes. Right? This is this is part of this is part of Canadian soccer. Right? This is a this is a club like Forge saying, "Hey, we want your best player. Do something about it." I think it's. Mm-hmm. I think it's. Uh, I think it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting that we even have this at this point. It's. It's. It's certainly worth talking about and, and relishing if you're a Forge fan for Pacific. Yeah, fans. if you're a Forge fan, not so if you're a Pacific fan. But as we know, whenever these acquisitions happen, you can only, I suppose, analyze it in a vacuum. This is a great day for Forge, but it allows other funds for Pacific to go shopping elsewhere, and we can't really analyze the whole process until everything's done until the start of the season, Charlie. But yeah. this is professional sports. This is free agency. This is what happens. And it's great that our league is getting involved in that. And maybe it's a little bit of a warning to some clubs, and some clubs do this better than others, we have to say, about getting your business done early and getting your players locked up long term. Yes. Yes, that is that is a big part of it. And I think, you know, maybe, maybe something that is lost in all the phrase that, yeah, this this didn't necessarily have to happen if, if you know, Pacific had, had maybe maybe acted earlier. But who knows? I don't know the full situation there. But this is, you know, it's huge news. It's a massive splash. I think this is actually the first time, if I'm not mistaken, that Forge have gone shopping within the CPL, which is interesting to see them developing and evolving as a club a little bit there. Uh, Yeah, I I think the thing that most stands out to me here is I cannot wait for Forge to travel to Vancouver Island next year. Mm. (laughs) Because I think that this is, you know, it starts with that final and now they're, these two players moving over. This is, could be the start of a pretty interesting and, and maybe unexpected rivalry in the CPL, which I am absolutely all for, and it's going to be really fun. Really disappointed that uh, that the Lakeside boys will have to re- retire that uh, Campbell soup, Tifo. That's right. Oh, no. <laughs> moving on. What, 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 are, what are the greatest pieces of art to come out of Canadian soccer? In <laughs> you, can get good, you can get good soup in Hamilton. So maybe they can start something up. <laughs> in the can or out, eh? doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. But 100%. Uh, all right, without further ado, we'll hear from uh, more from us three shortly. But uh, let's talk now with uh, technical director and head coach Bobby Sminiotis, who joined me earlier today on reflection after acquiring both these players through free agency, two stars and two champions within the CPL. Is Bobby Sminiotis talking amongst many things on the acquisition of Taryn Campbell and Alessandro Hajabrapur? Joined now by technical director and head coach of Forge FC, Bobby Smirniotis, on the day they complete the signing and announcement of Alessandro Hajab report, 24 hours after signing Taryn Campbell. Bobby, happy new year. Uh, how are things? Yeah, happy new year to you, Christian. Everything is going well. You know, it's, uh, it's a busy time of year, uh, getting ready to get started. And obviously with Champions League uh, ahead of us, uh, we've got some work to do. 
Well, I hope you had some deserved time off and a little bit of rest. I know trying to get away from football in the mind is never easy, but hopefully you had some healthy Christmas and New Year with the family. Let's get into the two signings. We're going to get into the Champions League draw with you as well uh, very shortly as that's around the corner as well. Uh, I want to start with your first announcement, and that came on Tuesday this week with the announcement of Terran Campbell. Uh, when was he on your radar? What is special about Terran that made you and your brother look pretty quickly at trying to sign him for this season? I think most importantly, you know, it's uh, we do a pretty good job of uh, of tracking these guys uh, in the league. You know, it's it's important for us. Terran's a player uh, that we've liked going back to to year one, uh, and just seeing his growth as a player and his his ability to put the ball in that. I think that's that's the biggest thing that he has, and and how he takes his positions in certain spaces. You know, the attacking part of the field goal is something that's uh, that's very important. Uh, for me, and I think it's just a, it's a good fit. You know, it's a it's a young player, a Canadian player, a player who's got a pedigree in the league. And, you know, it fits with the philosophy of what we want here. We want Forge to be a destination club for young, uh, aspiring Canadians. You know, that's what we want our club to be, and that's where we want how players uh, to look at us. And I think when you look at all of those things, you know, it's a, it's a perfect fit for the player, and it's a perfect fit for the club. What about his versatility as well, Bobby? He's not someone who can just play through the middle on his own. Or He, he played a lot on the left. He also played a lot on the right when Bustos got injured. Somebody who can play across all those three positions must be something extremely valuable. Yeah, I think looking at the way Forge has, has played and the way I kind of put the players out there, you know, versatility is something important for me. And, you know, the one big thing you see with Terran is obviously a guy who can play up top. But I think, you know, playing in between the gaps sometimes um, from a wide position, not necessarily as, as a winger, uh, but kind of playing the spaces in, in between the outside backs because that will give him a little bit more space to, to free himself up. And it gives uh, that tactical flexibility, you know, because you want these players to be able to move around the pitch and also provide something uh, different to your opponent uh, to look at game in and game out as we get into this new season. When you look back at the time, and you've had a little bit of time to do that now with games coming thick and fast, it was pretty difficult in the 2020 season. You had so many games, played 40 games in 162 days. With, upon that self-reflection, and, and I think you had an unbelievable season, I think I gave you a grade of an A-plus when I reflected on the year, but was the times where you thought maybe you just lacked that killer instinct a little bit more? I mean, your team was almost perfect in so many regards, but being super critical where you need to be, Bobby, is that something that you looked at and thought, we need to find a bit more of a clinical approach? Yeah, I think it's something you always have to look at. You know, I think when you look at the three years of, uh, of Forge's seasons, I think this was the best year of football all around them and the, and the football and the quality we've played, the versatility we've shown uh, tactically on the pitch. But you always have to look at the minute little things that, that keep on allowing your team to get better. So, so it is one of those things. And I thought we were a little bit better in being ruthless uh, around the goal. And, and we want to be better in that final third. Now, you also have to take into consideration our schedule this year. And you say, OK, which games this fatigue really hit in uh, that maybe kept you away from this. Uh, but I think always when you can uh, add quality uh, attacking pieces uh, to a squad um, that's done a good job of, of scoring goals, uh, that's done a good, very good job of creating opportunities, and you're able to add a piece in there who's got a great strike rate. I think with the opportunities we create, um, you know, Terran's a guy who's going to help us a lot. Before we get into Hajab report, just the final question on the front line. Um, what can you tell us right now about who you think will be retained there, who you're kind of not sure about, and who do you think or you know won't be back in that in those, in those positions? Yeah, I think uh, for the most part, we're retaining uh, quite a bit of the guys uh, in the front line. One guy who's, who's gone for sure is uh, Josh Navarro. Uh, Josh Navarro was on loan here um, from his club in Costa Rica, uh, and he'll be returning to them. And he did a great job here uh, with us over the season and really grew into the league and was – was an important player for us in, in CONCACAF league. Um, so, you know, we're happy with his, with his time here and probably would have liked to see him here a little bit longer, but he's returning to, to Costa Rica. And uh, from that point on, you know, a lot of the guys are here. I think we may see one or two guys uh, move to, to a higher level over these next, uh, next few weeks um, in the squad, but we're doing our best to keep uh, the bulk of this uh, squad together with the challenges we have in front of us, you know, looking at uh, Champions League, which is uh, something uh, we're obviously going to go into as we've gone into every competition we play in uh, in order to make sure we're doing a good job uh, in there. And then we look ahead of our season. We have got a 2020 and then over 2022, uh, the Canadian Championship game to play with, uh, with Toronto FC. And I think that will be something that will be on the schedule. So there's a lot to look forward to for these guys. 
Certainly is. It comes around thick and fast. Let's move to your second signing announced on Wednesday. Alessandro Hadzab report. The man, actually, who stopped you lifting the trophy, the one who scored the winning goal in the final game at Tim Hortons Field last season. Um, we've said consistently, Bobby, on many of our platforms, your midfield, Becker, CC, Janssen, whoever comes in, it's an MLS caliber midfield. You only get stronger today. What do you like about the acquisition of this player? Yeah, he can do a little bit of everything in that midfield. You know, I, I've seen him grow as a, as a player and play in, in different roles over the three years. Again, a player going back to 2019 that I thought was excellent as a, as a young guy and a, a player who has a, a massive upside. I think, you know, there's certain parts of his game tactically that, uh, that we can improve over here and we need to work on. Um, but he's a guy who can play at the six. He's a guy who can play in the eight, can play a little bit further up. Uh, the way we rotate uh, into a box midfield, um, and you just look at his intelligence on and off the ball. I think, you know, it's a, it's another excellent piece there. And when you look at, you know, those little details of, of how you improve a team, you know, sometimes you just got to make sure you bring in quality. Uh, I think uh, we see that all around. If, if you want a team to get better, you need, you need to also bring in more quality into the group and make sure that you've got a good competitive edge in the team. You know, we have a group of players, for the most part, who have been uh, around for three years. A lot of them will be back for their fourth year. So I think uh, creating uh, an even more competitive edge in training and in the positional uh, spots. Uh, will allow us to keep on uh, doing what we've done over these last few years. And Izzy, you mentioned you mentioned tracking him over the last three years, but this year, particularly, I talk about 2021, did you feel like he took an enormous jump or a, a rather large growth pattern up there? Because also played centre-back in some games as well, didn't he? I think the biggest thing uh, I saw in his game this year is he, he became a much more uh, physical player in, in being able to battle and win things uh, in the midfield and when he he dropped back and he, and he got a, you know, a different edge to his game. You know, he went from being a, a youth uh, youth player to, to a full pro. Uh, you know, it's kind of the easiest uh, way to put it. And, uh, you know, that's what makes it uh, very exciting. And it makes it very exciting to have him as part of this group where he can learn from some of our other uh, top midfielders, uh, but also make sure that he's pushing the envelope. You know, the expectation is for, for him to come in here and be a player who's, who's contributing day in, day out for the team. And like I've told both of the guys, you know, that's the expectation, but it only comes with their hard work in the squad. Yeah, no doubt. A similar question that I asked you about the forward line. How's the midfield looking in terms of returnees and what you expect it to be looking ahead towards this season? I think with today's announcement, it just got better. Um, you know, bottom line, um, that's that's what we want. We have to find a, a way, you know, each year um, to make the team better, to make a, to push the guys that, that are here. And uh, Alessandro's uh, addition to the squad, I think, only does that, makes our midfield better and, and gives us, um, the edge we want to, to keep on doing what we've done as Forge. What is the timeline now, Bobby? Obviously, the February Champions League is pretty quickly around the corner. When does uh, everybody get back in? What are you looking at on your calendar for this month? Yeah, so next week, the guys will start reporting uh, reporting back in for, uh, for medicals uh, meetings. And uh, we hit the pitch and we'll have roughly about four weeks of, uh, of prep time uh, ahead of that game. Uh, the first game at home against Cruz Azul where, you know, we're looking at the weather gods to give us a nice minus 20 at Tim Hortons Field um, for that game. But uh, all uh, kidding aside, we know what we have in front of us. We know who Cruz Azul is. You know, having this time period, it's uh, it's very good. They just started their Quasura Championship this past weekend um, with a 2-0 uh, win over uh, Club Tijuana. Um, so we're getting a good look at, the, at who they are as a club. They've had some uh, changes over this last month from the uh, end of the Apertura uh, Championship. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a club that uh, we know well, we're doing our homework on and we're going to get ourselves prepared. So, like I said, the guys are in uh, next week, four weeks of preparation, you know, with having a, a lot of the squad back. I think uh, that makes it an easier transition. And now it's a matter of, you know, making sure that uh, some of the new guys uh, coming in um, to the squad adapt quickly and, and get prepared for this first phase of the season for us. Fantastic stuff. I say this question knowing that you want to win that tie and you want to progress. But when that draw came out, you could have gone to a US team in MLS. You could have gone to another Mexican team, but you were given them, the Giants, the Estadio Azteca that comes with it. Was there a little bit of a smile on your face when, when that came through for you? Yeah, 100%. You know, you, you saw that and you, you immediately know uh, the tradition of the club, but you immediately also know where you're going. Uh, where you're going to play down there and you know that that's a massive challenge uh, and a challenge that uh, we look forward to we look forward to as as a team and the players and just discussing with the players uh, but even bigger than that as a coaching staff you know it's, it's one thing that uh, that I've enjoyed over these years in competing in the CONCACAF region is is just the challenge of, of the different of, uh, of the unknown 
from what you play week in and week out in your league. And I think that's uh, that's allowed us as a staff to grow. It's allowed our players uh, to grow, really push uh, push ourselves to the limits. And this is another uh, two games where we're going to have to do that as a as a club. And we take the first step on February 16th at Timberlands Field. Final couple of questions before you, before you let you go. How's the uh, how's the roster construction coming along? I know there's always things moving on every and again. We, you and I have talked a lot. You, you like it when other people like your players and given opportunities. Reports right now of Kwame we were getting potential uh, trial with the Vancouver Whitecaps. That's big for the club as well. How is that? How do you feel about that? And how's the shopping coming along? Yeah, on the, on the first phase, it's uh, you have to know that uh, you know with success comes uh, players moving on uh, from the club in different situations, uh, whoever those players uh, may be, and uh, and you have to be happy uh, for that uh, as an organization uh, and very proud of the players uh, um, that are doing that. Like I tell a lot of them, it's uh, you know I'd like to be here for ten years, you'd like to be here for ten years, but the reality is you know this is professional soccer and there's ladders to move up, and uh, when we have opportunities to do that. Uh, got to take advantage of it but that also comes through the work that they've done and that's the one thing that uh, that I know you know there's a lot of eyes on on the club and uh, and watching us um, throughout North America and Central America it's been interesting you know the talks we've had with Central American clubs uh, about players uh, at Forge and I think that's that's fantastic but more you know fantastic when we look forward to the league uh, as itself and just opening the eyes around the around the continent but in the roster construction I think everything is is in a good spot right now uh, what we're doing, we do a lot of our work early um, with the players and, and targets uh, that we look at. You're obviously thrown for a couple of loops along the way, and I think that's normal in the, in all club structures. Uh, but you know, when you look at these two guys, it was work that was done uh, done early in making sure that you know we're uh, we're front runners to be able to do that. And I think you know, as you know, the next few days and the next week comes, you know, we'll we'll be in a position to really give a a good update on on the roster and the roster start for uh, for this part of preseason. Fantastic stuff. Last one for you, Bobby. You ready for it again? You ready, mentally ready again, refreshed, had a few days off and uh, here it comes because you don't get much time off, but I know how much you love the sport. Yeah, of course. You know, it's great. You uh, you end up finishing the season. You've got about 10 days. You're, you're in the office, then you get home and, you know, everything's great around the holidays, right? You got Christmas, you got New Year's, you got this and that, and then New Year's goes by and you're like, let's just go. <laughs> uh, there's no need to, to waste any time. There's no need to stay away from it sometimes in the season. You say to yourself, ah, I could use a few days off, but I think we've had, we've had enough. And, you know, it's, uh, I think it's excellent. We're getting started uh, a little bit uh, earlier than maybe the rest of everyone. Um, just with the league probably starting later in April, you know, having this challenge in front of us and really having a, a clear ability to work on these games, you know, without the interference of, of the league. I think it's, uh, it's very good. It's very good uh, for the club. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Excellent stuff, Bobby. Always enjoy our chats. Thanks so much for your time and for your honest scouting reports on the two new players. Congratulations, two massive acquisitions for you. And we'll chat soon in the run-up to the game against Cruz as well. Thank you very much, Christian. Fascinating discussion as usual with Bobby. And uh, we'll get to some of the other business that he was talking about earlier in the, in the interview as well. And later with Kwame Awu's trial at the Vancouver Whitecaps. We'll get to that shortly. But I thought it was fascinating as well. Interesting with Charlie, you mentioned it off the top of the show, shopping within the league, evaluating the league better than other people as well. And I think it's clear that this was no impulse buy. This was no, these two are free agents. Let's go buy them and scoop them up from the champions. Um, you could tell that they, they, these two were on his radar for some time. And he's very excited to have them at the club, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting that this is a little bit of something new from Forge, I think, because they have been, you know, a little bit a little bit on an island in the way that they've built their club the last couple of years, right? They've, you know, done their scouting in international countries. They've brought in guys from certain levels. Obviously, a lot of the backbone of this team is players that have been together and, and played together at Sigma for so long, but now they're evolving a little bit. You know, they're, they're going within the league, and that's a testament to the rest of the league as well, you know, that... that Forge is now looking to, to to make moves within the league like that. But uh, the other thing that Bobby said right off the top there that was really interesting was that they want to be a destination club mm-hmm. in the league, right? Which is which is fascinating because you know most leagues and all around the world they have the clubs that fancy themselves the big clubs, right? And you know whether it's whether it's true or not, there are there are clubs that believe that they you know they want to attract the players, they want to be the team that can offer more than other clubs and foresee themselves as that and you know obviously they have two championships and now they're going into the champions league uh so you know fair enough and i think it's really interesting just to see this little bit of development from forge and i think it's going to be a pretty entertaining offseason obviously pacific is a club that 
you know, last season and and the off season before, they were a club that was a bit of a destination for players, right? With Marco Bustos going there and then Manny Aparicio and so on and so forth from within the league. So, you know, Forge lost to them. <laughs> so maybe it's a leaf out of their book. I'm all in on that, by the way. You know, that, that tier pyramid system that exists all over the world in this sport, you know, there, there, are, there are teams at the very top and there's a lot of people who despise them. And that mm-hmm. just brings out emotion and storylines and driven that can drive leagues forward all in all. And by the way, they won't always be there. Right no, now, they no. may feel like they're there, but this is a sport that very much is, is cyclical, particularly in the salary cap league. If you do your homework and do your research, where you are right now, it's definitely not maybe where you are, you are in a year or two. And, and Forge, they'll know that this is a window for them to continue to drive forward. And sports doesn't give you that, that opportunity all of the time. Uh, but it is fascinating to hear some of the other things he was talking about there in terms of preparing for the Champions League and how he still feels like most players are going to be back. He did mention that Josh Navarro will be gone. There are rumblings, nothing to be confirmed that Moba Bully may not be back. We'll have to find out about that at another time. Um, but even with the Hajab report stuff, when I talked about that, you know, it seems like a, a real depth yeah. signing, a player that's going to play a ton of minutes, Marty, but not somebody you're going to say, oh, suddenly we're using Janssen and we're losing Janssen and we're bringing in a Jabba Paul. It looks like um, the team who finished top of the table in the regular season, they've just got stronger here and they're not necessarily getting weaker and just replacing the, some of the parts. Well, it's funny, KJ. I don't know how Hajabapur and Janssen are both going to get on the pitch. These are two of your favorite players. Devastating day for you, I suppose. Uh, but for <laughs> Forge, it's good. Um, I mean, what what a what a depth signing this is. Bobby obviously talked about in in that interview talking about um, wanting a bit more tactical flex uh, tactical flexibility out of him and and trying to sort of mold him and, and moving him into something else, which is which is intriguing. Something we'll we'll see over time, but. Yeah, I don't know, Charlie, if you have anything else to add about a player like that getting slotted into Forge's midfield. Yeah, well, just the thing about Forge's midfield, I mean, obviously we talked a lot about how, we talk a lot about that trio, you know, Becker and, and Cisse and Ashley Oda Janssen and how unbelievably good they are. But in this Forge roster, you know, I think that might be the part where they've been the least deep, especially mm-hmm. this last year. You know, I think we saw we saw in some of the Champions League games. I think it was one of the was it one of the Matago games where uh, where Janssen was suspended and they were really missing him for that right. game, yeah. and that was a real problem. And so now, you know, regard notwithstanding who's coming and going, we don't know for sure any of that just yet. But you know, if you add a fourth guy that's maybe part of that that trio that you rotate through, then I think you really help yourself a lot, especially if you've got all this congestion you're going through various competitions and i think that really does add a lot to forge whether or not you can get you probably you obviously can't get all four of them on the pitch at the same time but i think that really does help you out a lot in that regard yeah it brings versatility too no like if you say you want to go back to a back three and Janssen plays in the back three and then suddenly you want to play a jab report and cc in front and then becker a little bit higher or you can play a yep. four two three one with a jab report and Janssen together and cc could play right back and suddenly you've got becker forward a little bit further forward as well so i think to you you know cal becker will do anything he's asked and uh back to what we've recapped he was named number one in our cpl 50 for a reason and uh, there were times this year quite a lot of times this year where he was asked to play as a six and I think Bobby Smith has been quite open and honest saying it's not his favorite position. But when he does, he may well be brilliant at it within the CPL. But now with the addition of a jab report, I think we're going to see less time of Kyle Becker playing as a six and more further forward where he can obviously dictate the play and control forward the matches as well. Uh, we haven't spoken much about Terran Campbell, so let's do that next. But before we do that, let's hear from the man himself. He joined us on our show earlier today and he, co- and he caught up with our very own Charlie O'Connor. Taryn Campbell, the last time we spoke, uh, it was before the CPL final and you were a Pacific player, but the next time we see you on the pitch, you will be wearing orange for Forge FC. Uh, this is a big move, a really surprising move for everybody. Maybe let's just start with your overall thoughts on you know this move and why why, why this, this appealed to you, why this is something that you know happened for you at this time. Uh, well, I've been in the league for uh, three years now, and I think um, for me, I think it's just about trying something new. Um, I had a really good time at Pacific, and I love the club. Uh, but for me, I think it's time to move on and just uh, to try something new. I've been at home uh, on the West Coast for a long time. I haven't really been around, so I think it's time for me to uh, just move on from the club and try something different. Definitely want to 
talk about Forge in a second here and what this all means, but just quickly before we do, let's maybe put a, a bow on your time at Pacific. Three years there, lots of individual success. You obviously won a championship there not too long ago. Just how are you going to look back on, on those three years that you had at that club and what that did for your career? Uh, it's going to be so memorable. I mean, uh, I can't appreciate the club enough. I mean, they've given me so much. Uh, they get, really gave me the opportunity to play uh, professional football. And uh, I'll be forever grateful to uh, James and uh, the ownership and Pa and uh, Michael Silverbauer back from the first year. And just everyone at the organization, I'll be grateful for them. And uh, I'll definitely remember the winning a championship, but also remembering uh, the struggle from first year and the build up to winning that championship. So speaking of that championship, you're now going to walk into the dressing room at Forge as, you know, one of the guys that, that just beat them in that final, right? You obviously won't be going alone. You'll have Ali Hijabrapour there with you as well. But what do you think this is going to be like coming into this Forge dressing room? I'm sure it'll be an interesting situation for you guys, right? Yeah, I, I think it will for sure. But I think uh, I think it'll kind of break the ice, just sort of, um, you know, beating Lambert and uh, being part of the club now. I think it'll sort of just break the ice. I don't think there will be any, uh, like, uh, bad intentions from anyone there. Are you maybe grateful that Ali's going as well? So you've got maybe one guy that you at least already <laughs> already know there? Yeah, that'll be nice. <laughs> uh, so just let's let's talk about Forge a little bit more. Just what was it maybe about that club specifically, about playing under Bobby Smirniotis, about playing with that team? What was it about them that maybe stood out to you and, and appealed to you? Well, they've been a, a really good club for the past three years now. And uh, they play a really good brand of football. And uh, like I said, I had the opportunity to go there. Um, like I said, it was my time to try something new. And uh, uh, yeah, I really just want to try something new. And they're, they're also in the Champions League, so it's a really good opportunity. Uh, yeah, just uh, I think it'll be a really good opportunity for myself to try something new um, with a different brand of football. The CONCACAF Champions League is an important one, I think. I know, obviously, Forge's season is starting a little bit earlier than every other CPL team because they've got that that tie with Cruz Azul, that trip to the Azteca coming up in February. Taryn, just how much was that, you know, a bit of an extra draw for you just to have that, maybe that opportunity, which I know can do a lot for players' careers? Well, yeah, it's a really good opportunity for not just uh, myself, but for the, the league and also the club. Um, hopefully we can do well in that game. Of course, we're going in there to win. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited. Yeah, I think we're all excited to see a CPL team at the Estadio Azteca. And I can't imagine yeah. just how exciting it would be to to be facing that as a player. Uh, Taryn, I don't know how much maybe you've, I don't know how much at this point you've spoken to, to Bobby Smirniotis or even some of your teammates about, you know, what you think it's going to be like at Forge. But how much have you heard maybe just for yourself as a player about, you know, what you think your role is going to be like with this club? Um, well, I would expect to play as the number nine. You know, um, I think my best attribute is uh, being around the 18-yard box, scoring goals. Um, and I think I can do that uh, at this club. So um, we'll see how things uh, play out. Very interesting stuff from Taryn Campbell. Uh, lots to get into on this. It was interesting how he said he was excited about playing a different brand of football. Um, and then I think the most interesting thing came at the end when he talked about it as a number nine. You know, obviously, I addressed it with Bobby Smirniotis when I talked about his tactical versatility. Can he play? Yeah, I threw it out there. He could play as a number nine, but also on either side. And the first thing Bobby said was down the middle. Uh, so, again, we I think even though he played a ton of the year, on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And Bobby said he's very good inside those pockets. It appears that maybe he's expecting Charlie to be their main man up front here as the number one striker. Yeah, yeah. I have to think that that was probably part of the conversation that they had. You know, it, it, it's, he's very, Terrence very open and honest about the fact that, you know, he can do, do the job on the wings, but he wants to be the center forward. He wants to be the guy who's in the box, you know, playing the hold-up play, Maybe, maybe playing off those passes, but also scoring the goals from the middle. And he, he likes that, and he's proven over three years that he's very good at that. And I think that is the kind of player that Forge need, right? They need they, they can always use another guy who's very clinical in the box, who's reliable, who's, you know, as, as dependable as Terry Campbell has been. I, he barely ever misses a game in the CPL. He's very resilient. Uh, he, 
he you know he will do the job that you need him to but more than anything else he is just this proven goal scorer at, at this level in this league and you know for as good as forge have been as many goals as they've scored whenever you ask bobby smirniotis he'll always say that they can be better with finishing they can be more clinical in the box uh especially at, at the Concacaf level and against some of these these top teams uh so i i think it is going to be a pretty good fit there that was Terran Campbell. Let's hear now from the other acquisition. And Marty Thompson caught up with him. Here's Alessandro Hajabrapo. And to another part of Forge FC's uh, uh, recent additions in Alessandro Hajabrapo, going from Pacific FC to Forge FC along with, with Terran Campbell. Uh, thank you so much for the time, Alessandro. Really appreciate it. Um, last time we were talking to you, just we had a similar conversation with Terran Campbell. Uh, you were scoring a goal at Tim Hortons Field to win a championship, more or less. Um, walk us through this process of now, you know, obviously having that moment in your career and now um, getting ready to suit up for Forge FC. Yeah, so that moment probably uh, every CPL fan kind of knows is my one of the best moments in my life, in my career, and one of the best days that could go. Um, but my contract came to an end and I kind of felt that it was just the best opportunity for me to kind of move on. I spent three years in Bank, uh, Victoria, playing with a uh, wonderful team, wonderful organization. But I just felt that it was time for me to try something else. Yeah, and I know Tara has said something very similar to us as well. Um, before we talk about Pacific, before we even talk about Ford, just talk a little bit about how this deal came together. Like you said, your contract was up. So, so what was it that really drew you to Forge and, and how did that process play out over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, I mean – if they win the league kind of back-to-back -back and the way they've been playing in the Champions League qualifying and things like that, I mean, you always want to watch the top teams. So throughout the past three years, I've been watching a lot of Forge's games and seeing their players. Obviously, you step onto the field with them and you see their quality as well. So when they kind of express interest at the beginning, obviously you have uh, some doubts moving in intra intra-league, I guess you could say. You don't want to surprise too many people, things like that. But it took a lot of thinking. This is not a decision that was just made like within weeks. It kind of took months uh, to decide what was best for me. But ultimately, taking in all the pros, the cons, this was what I thought would be best for my career. And Bobby Smiriotis, coach of Forge FC, is going to have quite a bit to say. But you're going to have to watch the podcast. This is going to be playing live. You're going to have to watch it. I can't relay everything you said uh, about yourself. But – you stepping into this team, you already mentioned sort of the pedigree you talked about. This is a team that, that people in the league like to watch. What can you say about your role specifically in coming into this Forge FC yeah. midfield that, you know, at least if 2021 is to be concerned, is, is obviously pretty high power? Yeah, obviously they have one of the strongest midfields in the entire league. I think my mindset going in is what can I add? What can I bring to, uh, to an already very powerful uh, team? Honestly, I'm just looking forward to getting a new perspective on coaching, on playing, on different types of teammates. I mean, my whole life, pretty much, I've been raised on the West Coast, playing on the West Coast, been taught by the same type of style, I guess you could say, in the Whitecaps program. Even the two Pacific coaches both learn their trade kind of in the Whitecaps program. So it's going to be kind of a different different uh, idea of playing, maybe different coaching uh criticisms that I can look forward to you know as a young player you kind of want to be as well-rounded and kind of an all-around player uh, depending on your position but for me that's my goal I'm going here to to become uh, an even better player to grow my game and just a couple more we do have to talk about Pacific a bit because you know if we turn back the clock to 2019 you know, you're a teenager going into that group and now three years later, you know, you look at your trajectory and, and many players out of that program, trajectories have just gone, you know, through the roof for, for many of you in that in that young group. Um, just talk a little bit about your time at Pacific and, and maybe some fond memories, you know, what will you take away from that part of your career? Yeah, I'll just start off by saying that Pacific was probably the three best years of my life in terms of football. I mean, I have Started as a teenager, a 19-year-old who had never been in a real professional team in a program like that, coming in and they showed belief in me right away. Was not dependent on coaches, but the whole club kind of 
had the trust the kids type of mentality. And right from the beginning, they showed their belief in all of us, including myself. So I have absolutely nothing, no hard feelings towards them. I loved my time over there. The city was nice. The fans were great. Um, yeah, it was a good time. It was it was good for my career. I think I grew from being just a kid in a professional team to kind of a man at the end of it. And luckily, it kind of ended well. But at the same time, being there for so long, it was kind of getting comfortable almost. And I'm not someone who wants to always be in a comfortable situation. I mean, when you're getting pushed and you're kind of out of your comfort zone is when you become the best player that you can. And that was kind of my motivation behind the whole thing. Well said. Um, one final one here. Next time we see you in, well, the first time we'll see you in Forge FC, Orange will be on February 16th at Tim Hortons Field. That'll be a cold one. But really it is the game um, at Estadio Azteca against Cruz Azul, the one following that, that, I mean, you know, it, I don't want to put words in your mouth, mouth, Alessandro, but that has to be such a carrot in this deal. That has to be such a, an important thing. Just talk about those two games coming up and, and what that could mean for your career and, and for the club going forward. Uh, I would agree that it is a big game for the club and for myself, but it wasn't really as much of a deal breaker as maybe some people in the league think or some people have seen. It is a great opportunity, and I'm sure myself as well as the rest of the team, the organization, will attack the opportunity to play that game fondly. I think we'll go into the game knowing that we can. We can show ourselves and we can play, and we're going to try to win. That's the way you play every game, right? But in terms of my signing, it wasn't that big of a deal. I think more the organization, the players surrounding it, the people inside were the big factors in why I want to get why I wanted to play for Forge. Uh, I think the, another big thing is just their style of play and the way they go about the game. You know, it's a very team-oriented style of play. They like to keep the ball. Kind of what I like to play and kind of suits my style. So, yeah, the game is, is there, and it's obviously in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about signing for Forge, but it wasn't the ultimate deal-breaker, as many people might think. Big thanks to Alessandro Hajabapur and Taryn Campbell for joining on the show. And, of course, Bobby Smeniotis. Uh, happy belated birthday, by the way. Alessandro Hajabapur turned 22, I believe, on Monday. Yeah. Taryn Campbell, only 23. I bring that up because we'll put a bow on this before we get into the rest of the league. Two young men who've made a bit of a bold decision here. You know, I think both of them have alluded to the fact that they wanted to be continued to be challenged, challenged tactically, challenged by different teammates, challenged in a different environment, challenged in life by moving to a new city and challenged by different coaching. When both of them probably, well, not probably, no, I know, knowing how much Pacific liked them, uh, could have stayed in a comfort zone. And that says a lot about these two young men who, oh, no, that they obviously want to play at a higher level above the CPL as well. Charlie, that's certainly something I took out of this. Yeah, it, it is. I think comfort zone is is kind of the right phrase here because, you know, Hajab Rapport and, and Campbell, I guess Hajab Rapport had one, you know, stint in his youth career in, in Bulgaria. Campbell never really played outside of, of BC except for, you know, very small stints. Both of them have been kind of closer to home most of their careers. They were at Pacific and they were very comfortable there, obviously have very entrenched roles at that club and had had their individual success there. So it is a bit of a bit of a bold move a bit of a gamble if we want to call it to make a move like this but you know it is it is just a a testament to that kind of ambition you know it's not obviously pacific is a club that won the championship so you can't you can't call it a step up but you can call it a step to a different challenge right right which is which is exactly what both players i think said and and it is you know pretty true they want to test themselves outside of that comfort zone outside of coaches and teammates that have known them for years right because that's that's the kind of situation that they were in at pacific and now they go to something completely different to see you know can you sink or swim in a completely new environment and it is going to be fascinating to watch with both players this season who are both very young still and you know have obviously ambitions of moving beyond the cpl right right we're still going to see it take a while to sink in i'm not going to lie seeing the jab report there in his forge hoodie <laughs> yeah it's nasty still weird body no it's weird. weird yeah it's just yeah it's it's un uncanny valley territory here, sure. <laughs> it's it's it really is up there um we, we'll finish on forge in this way uh we heard from bobby smendiotis navarro's gone another news will be coming out soon um 
What we do know, and has now since become public, is Kwame Wua will be on trial with the Vancouver Whitecaps. Uh, Axel Schuster and the Whitecaps have offered him a trial there and well, could well go on and succeed there to become a full-time Major League Soccer player. A player that we've all been a big fan of, a player that came in very high in the CPL 50. Uh, I think, I believe, top 12, was it? Top 15, I think 13th maybe, uh, around about that, and just thinking off offhand. Uh, an outstanding player who was very close to being nominated for Player of the Year. Within our, with our league for 2021. And um, I think all three of us would wish him nothing but the best, knowing that he's obviously had MLS experience in the past and could certainly do a good job in, in MLS, Marty. Yes, he, he's, he's certainly worthy of the opportunity. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think his chances are quite high at this point. He's shown his versatility uh, with New York and then obviously here with Ford. So yeah, best of luck to him on the West Coast as we see someone going, I guess, the opposite way on the, the sort of Pacific Ocean Hamilton Highway. <laughs> no one's a bigger fan of him than you, though, Charlie. I think so. Yeah. You, you oh. must be pretty. You must be pretty happy with this. And, and, and again, to speak to her Jabba Poor and Campbell's point, a player that has been in a high level, high performance environment for three years, excelled without question. I mean, he's a very different player to Abzi, but it, uh, an elite left back at the level that they need him to be. Can drop into midfield where he's played in the past. Technically, very savvy. Uh, all the signs are pointing towards. Obviously, extremely fit, good head, and, a good guy, good head on his shoulders. All signs are pointing towards this could be a very good matchup for the Whitecaps and Kwame Wu. I think so, yeah. I mean, we've talked about it all year. Bobby Smyrniotis has, has agreed on several occasions. Kwame Wu has the skill set to play in MLS, I think. And I think I think this is... A, obviously, we've seen it before, but he's a little bit older now than he was back then at, at New York City. He's a little bit you know, more tactically you know, adept and, and capable now because he's obviously played that had that experience in New York and had this experience under Bobby Smyrniotis. He's got, you know, more of a, a resume. He's got more game film on on himself now right. at, you know, playing at this level in the CPL and obviously in CONCACAF uh, against teams that MLS sides have had trouble against in the past. Uh, I, th I think, I, obviously, we, we don't know where this trial will go. It's just a trial at the moment still. Uh, but even that, even that, uh, the fact that he's there is, Good news for the CPL for all of us. You know they're they're watching, and it's good news for all the other players at every club and and at Forge in particular that these teams are watching and and you know you can get interest from them and uh, you know just just the best players in this league will rise to the top and eventually get those opportunities. So I think that's the most important thing. No doubt about it. Uh, watch this space for more developments with the roster construction for Forge, as we heard from Bobby Smyrniotis, and with Pacific. Lots of developments coming there as well, and more ins, I would expect, than outs. We know they've lost Hutt Campbell and Ajabrapur, Victor Blasco to Honduras as well. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on the champs and what they're going to be releasing and announcing in the next few weeks. Uh, let's do a roundabout walk around the league, and let's probably go with Cavalry. They finished third. And uh, before we get to the busiest team, I want to talk to you about the team who finished fourth in a minute. Uh, but Cavalry had six contracts expired. Amongst them were obviously Oliver Minitel, Richard Luca, Mo Farsi is probably the headline here. Uh, we reported before the end of the year that Farsi and Calvary had a number of negotiations that didn't go quite the way that they wanted. Uh, I'm sure they can have him back at some point. Uh, but they were only the six contracts expired. So, Charlie, I don't know what you think about this. Is it a bigger deal that they're not bringing back Farsi or is it a bigger deal that they're actually retaining so much going into next season? Yeah, I I think that it is, it is a bit of a, a shock. To see to see Farsi move on like that, uh, although I guess not necessarily because he's he's a very good player, and I think it sounds like he's going to have opportunities at other levels that you know he probably deserves after the way that he's played in a CPL, especially this last season. But yeah, it, it's good for Cavalry. Obviously, they had a bit of a tough year with some players that they brought in didn't really get get going the way they wanted because of injuries and various things like that. So I think really the best thing you can do if you're Cavalry is to run it back as much as you can you right. know, with, with these players that you brought in and you hope just that, you know, you, you can Im improve on that and build on that because they had some pretty big highs and lows in this past season, I think we would say. Uh, but we know that the talent is there. We know that, you know, Tommy Wheeldon Jr. is a very good coach and, and he's got an image for this club that, and something that he wants to see with them. So they will be an interesting team to watch to see how they maybe fill some of these holes that they've, They've lost, obviously, in addition to those contracts, Karifa Yao's loan is over, so he's back with Montreal now. And, yeah. you know, I think judging by how he played in the CPL last year, I'd be stunned if he was back in this league in this this next year because I'm, I'm pretty sure Montreal will be 
quite happy with seeing what he did at Cavalry. So that's another, you know, another thing that Cavalry will have to address in this offseason. So it will be interesting to see how they how they, you know, fill these holes and, and try to improve that squad. One other subtraction from Cavalry has been the assistant coach, Martin Nash, who leaves the leaves the mountains of Calgary to come to Toronto and the and and, and play and, and manage for York United. And we're going to get to York quite heavily here for the next five minutes or so because there's been a ton of things announced there. But we have to start with Martin Nash. This was announced over the New Year period, um, before Christmas, I believe. And I have to say, I'm very impressed with the acquisition of Martin Nash. I don't know what you think, Marty. I'll go to you first. But his interview when he when he when he was introduced, I thought was very impressive. He's a very calm character, but I know he can he, he, when he needs to be, he can rile up the players. Tactically, very, very savvy. Reads the game very well. Got a tremendous resume. A cerebral thinker. And I, I have, for one, you know, I'm just delighted. One, he's got the opportunity because all leagues need to do this. Your assistants, you build up, you work under Tommy, and Tommy had some great things about him. And then you get the opportunity. I, you know, wherever he was going to go, I'm just delighted that he's got that opportunity. And our league is better for it that he's been given that chance. Yeah, it's certainly a, certainly a logical choice for both parties, and I'm glad you mentioned that sort of that upward trajectory because, yeah, Martin totally deserves this opportunity and what a group of players this is as well. I know I got to speak uh, at length with, with Angus McNabb uh, at York about signing him and talking about how, you know, he first met him at the finals in 2019 right after they had lost, and he talked about how Martin was able to give him this very astute sort of tactical breakdown of what they got wrong, and he just said he mm. kind of paused and thought, you just lost a final, like, like, shouldn't you be slamming the table with your beer, you know, and, and, and losing your mind? So that seemed to be quite a positive. And then, you know, they were also able to meet quite a bit uh, ahead of time, too, uh, in person in, in New York, which was great. So, yeah, I mean, it's a logical choice. And another reason why Martin Nash is important for these players is that this is another young Canadian group. I know we'll talk about the international players, but this is going to be a player that um, that will be able to connect with these players, you know, obviously the same way Jimmy Brennan was, frankly, um, and and hopefully be able to to drive that forward. Yeah, and obviously a number of departures: Nate Ingham, Julian Ubrecht, Alvaro Rivero, amongst others. Um, but a lot of, I think, very impressive additions uh, by this team. Mamadou Kane's come in. Uh, Daniel Oberkiar from Denmark, who I've seen clips of, and let me tell you, this kid's nineteen. Uh, a very brave and astute defender, a kind of ball playing defender out. You know, I don't want to compare him too much to a Crutzen or a Klomp, but he's got that kind of ability to play the ball out uh, and, and, and I think take chances, What the, which is what this team needs, a bit of a playmaker from deep positions that can really play well with the other, well, you know, obviously Dom Zator and many others there, the defensive players. Eduardo, Eduardo Jesus comes in from Brazil, a left back uh, from Vitória, who's a, a very good set piece threat, very p- pacey as well. He can also play central midfield. And Martin Grizziara from uh, the Czech Republic, uh, who's got a tremendous resume, obviously including Fiorentina, Arsenal, Sparta, Prague, amongst others. So as usual, um, quite an international flavor to this team, but they've got, looked like they've got a lot of young players uh, and players that can go on and succeed here. And I think the depth is going to be a lot stronger, uh, Marty, going into this year than in the past. Well, yeah, and even you just kind of touched on a few of those players, but someone like William Wallace, who I think Charlie and I dedicated an entire podcast to last year, <laughs> uh, for for many different reasons, it's 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 it goes without explaining. And Lissandra Cabrera and Mateo Hernandez, who were on loan yep. um, in, in Costa Rica, these are players that were meant to be part of this core and part of this depth um, for I guess twenty twenty. So or in through twenty twenty one. So yeah, the, the the depth is is the interesting choice because you know you look at a player like Lowell Wright now with quite a bit of you know uh, with quite a bit of. Um, a, a, a spot to a spot to earn that's for sure and you look at yeah. all these other players and you know michael petrasso max ferrari i say johnson's still in this team right they retained all these players so yeah depth is certainly there and hey i mean they've got what i think 21 players confirmed at this point so so they're well ahead of the other clubs at this point in in, in terms of actually finding that depth and publicly putting it out there yeah it should be interesting charlie any thoughts on york conditions before we move on yeah i think it's Really exciting to see this team. You know, I think that this team is still built around these young Canadian players. That's still the backbone of this club. And I think that the international players that they're bringing in are, in in certain ways, an investment in continuing to improve those young players by surrounding them with good players who have seen the game at at various levels around the world. I think it's all it's all about you know improving these young Canadians who are. I think most of them. I think four or five of them were given long term contracts during yeah. this last season. 
Yeah. So the idea is to surround them with talent, develop them, sell them on eventually. But you know, obviously, if you're if you're York, hopefully win a trophy in in between there first. And it is a really really exciting thing to see what they're doing with this roster, and you know, just to have everything so so certain. I think this early in the off season is also uh, pretty good for this team. Yeah, let's stay out east. Uh, I've got Halifax, who announced on the 5th of January their roster construction so far, announcing 15 players returning, including new contracts for the League Player of the Year, Jean Morelli, Peter Charles coming back, Andre Rampa said new contract for Alex Marshall, amongst others. Corey Bent will all be back as well. Eight will be leaving, including Maury Dona, James Rafard as well. Uh, and also today announced that a very interesting acquisition to be their new assistant coach, Alejandro Dorado, who was a six-year at Real Madrid assistant youth coach and also assistant air coach at FC Honka in Finland and also to Rafa Benitez as an assistant coach uh, in China. So that's an, a really interesting player, uh, sorry, an interesting name to keep an eye on away from the player acquisition. And hey, maybe one day a full-time head coach in our league, but great to see top coaches with great resumes coming in. Um, Charlie, that was a really interesting hire, I thought. You know, it was interesting to see them do that. And what are your thoughts on uh, the way that they're putting this team together? I suppose much needed continuity there as they continue to shop around to fill out the last few bits of the roster. Yeah, I mean, obviously this last year was very disappointing for Halifax after going to the final the year before. You know, I think nobody there would disagree with that, uh, except except for the individual season of Joao Morelli. It was disappointing mostly across the board but you know most of most of these players that have had good moments had good good performances for this team in the past are coming back there is continuity and that's always important for a club especially when you have a bit of a down year you don't right. when you know that you've got talent when you trust in your squad you don't need to blow it up because it doesn't quite go your way they trust these players they trust these core and that's good there are players that are that are moving on that are a little surprising and i think will be interesting how you address that i think maury donor is obviously the big one who had some unbelievable performances for the club this year missed out on on a little bit of the season due to some injury troubles you know maybe if he'd if he'd been able to be healthy for longer maybe it's a different story but that's going to be a, a player they have to replace stefan karyovanovich uh, is a player that we've talked about a lot didn't get his goal but you know he was he was that player that every time we saw him we're like wow this guy's got to score eventually because he looks good but I guess not. I'm sure he's got other options as well. Uh, but yeah, the, you've still got those those core players in place. Obviously, Morelli coming back is huge. Mm. And Peter Schala, who's kind of... Peter Schala and Andre Rampers had kind of the heart and soul of this club is also amazing. So, you know, I, I think that if you're Halifax, you're not, in a, you're not in a bad spot at the moment. Let's wrap up the East Coast with you, Marty, to Ottawa, where we don't know too much. We know announcements to come on Thursday in terms of how some players will be returning. Um, I believe, and just some of the players that won't be returning. I think that might be coming out on Thursday. But yeah. um, my point being here is Mista is the big story. There's a new coach coming in. We don't know who that is yet. That will be announced pretty soon. We know we've got the U-Sports draft next week, so the coach will be probably put in place soon. The U-Sports draft, by the way, 8 o'clock Thursday, the 20th of January. Uh, you can watch that live on all of our platforms and also on One Soccer. Uh, but we've said goodbye to Mista who I know Charlie was a particular favorite of. <laughs> uh, so he can laugh away, and I'm sure he's written to him already, but we'll come to you first, Marty, because your thoughts on what needs to happen here in Ottawa, where it looks like, again, um, major turnover happening. Uh, yeah, re uh, rest in peace to the Mista vibes, the Mista vibes, uh, at, at least in the CPL for now. For now, that we'll miss change. his smile and his personality. For yes, me. most certainly, most certainly. Yeah, it's uh, it's um, this could go this could go in many different directions, right? We we know that there are some of those lone players that uh, that could be factored out of this at least uh, temporarily, right? If you think about a player like Keishan Ferdinand, the two players from Madrid, you know, there there are a few things you can kind of piece together. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 very much pick a couple players and and try to move on. I don't really see them taking. I don't, know, I don't really see them taking more than let's say like eight to 10 players. I feel like that's maybe your limit and, and try to go from there. Uh, Charlie, what do you think about um, what's up here? I mean, they can't, they can't retain Mista, obviously, but to anyone else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of flexibility here, right? Yeah. You know, you, when you bring in a new coach, he's coming in and he's got, you know, at, at the moment, almost a blank slate. You can basically build the club the way you want. These first two years of, of Ottawa's, existence have been a little you know stop start and, and 
challenging for this club, just trying to to kind of get off the ground. Obviously, 2020 was very tough. They had to kind of throw a team together. Uh, and, and you know, they, they did fairly well under the circumstances. This past year, you know, again, they, they had signs of improvement at times, but then there were setbacks. They obviously gave away a penalty almost every game, and that's not what you want to do. <laughs> when you phrase it like that, yeah, that's Captain, so I mean, it's, not, it's not ideal. But, yeah, I, I think this is kind of an opportunity to – I, not not exactly start over by any means, but maybe maybe just take a couple steps back, take a deep breath, you know, bring in a new coach who's got who got a new vision for the club. Decide what you want to build and and go from there. You've got time, you've got you know the the roster flexibility, and I think it's going to be better for them in the long run because obviously there is you know plenty of work to do in Ottawa. So it is going to be interesting to see who comes in first of all as coach, and then how they you know see this club how how they maybe shape it and make it their own over these next couple months talking of new coaches phil de santos gets to have a full season in winnipeg at vala next season and we'll do a lot of time previewing that i think he got 12 points from his last 10 games came very close to making the playoffs they've announced that moses dyer willie mckeo daryl fordice rafa oheen uh stefan Kamara, and andrew jean baptiste will all be returning and diego gutierrez is back marty on this so uh, already um a pretty good foundation here for this team of Phil DeSantos, who also added a new assistant coach in Jay Bindi as well today. Yeah, that core is is quite spectacular. And yeah, shout out to Diego Gutierrez coming back uh, from 2019 and in 2020. Um, yeah, I mean, if you think about a player like Stefan Zabara, how crucial he was to, to to their to their I mean to their early run in the bubble, and then after um, Akio announcing Akio and Dyer on the same day, by the way, was just criminal. Like it's two players. <laughs> I mean, it's it's true. Like, these are two players that you look at it on paper, like, you know, see how well they played under Phil DeSantos, especially in those last couple of months. Like, yeah, these are these are two of the best strikers in the league, frankly. So, yeah, this is a this is a really exciting core. It's just going to be interesting to see what happens with the with the rest of them. Right. Obviously, had all those loans that ended. Um, yeah. Sirawa being an important one goalkeeper of the year. Um, you know, you look at players like maybe Kevin Allman, Brett Levi, you know, there's still a couple of those players that will, will be interesting to see what, what happens, but, uh, yeah, we'll be on the lookout. Austin Ritchie as well, actually is another player that we don't know the status on yet. So yeah, still more work to be done potentially. We'll keep it posted to this podcast and all of your news at campl.ca. And we're getting news every day. And by the way, we're also, after the U Sports draft next week, going to ramp up our coverage for the Canadian men's national team as an enormous World Cup window is on the horizon. We'll finish the show with the Eddies. And we don't know tons of what's going on right now, but we do know that number eight in the CPL 50, their best player last year and top goal scorer in the CPL, Easton Ongaro, is gone. He's signed for Uta Arad in Romania. And um, good for him. That's all we'll say right there. But it's a magnificent oh, yeah. signing for him. I know that he wanted to get back out into Europe. Uh, I think grew a ton this year on the field, particularly out of the bubble. The bubble was not easy for him. Just one of those things where a striker just couldn't get it going. It could have gone one way for him. It certainly could have gone the way, you know, where it didn't necessarily work out for him. But he ended up turning around on a difficult team and powered through. And I thought had a terrific season and deserved a top 10 in the CPL 50. We're hopefully going to speak to Easton and get you a piece up on campl.ca this week as well. Uh, but Charlie, your thoughts on his move to Romania, a chance for him to go out there again into Europe and to try and, you know, succeed in the European market, which has been exciting for a young Canadian player. Yeah, I think it's great for Easton. And it felt like something that, was going to happen at some point, you know, Easton Ongaro, if, if he's going to keep scoring at the rate he has been, uh, you know, at, at a rate that nobody else had been in a CPL, eventually you're going to get that opportunity. And uh, yeah, I, I think as we all are, I'm very happy for him and excited to see what he can do. I don't know a whole lot about the Romanian league, but um, I mean, we know that, that Easton obviously had that loan stint last winter in, in Denmark, I believe at, at Venzisel. Mm -hmm. And that went, that went, pretty well for him he started yeah. to heat up a lot you know towards the end of that stint before he actually got recalled to Edmonton uh, so he's you know had that little bit of a taste there already in Europe and now he's obviously off to a very different country but he's in in Romania and I think it is going to be exciting to see how we've talked about it all podcast how he accepts this new challenge and how he maybe you know does under that that new pressure that new environment it is the top tier of Romania and Uta Arad I believe are ninth 
right now in a 16-team league. So around about five or six points out of the playoffs at the moment, but a competitive team. A team, by the way, that was once in the European Cup, the now, the now known as the Champions League. I think they got to the last 16 once um, back in the early 70s. So a competitive place. A team that's played in the Champions League, you played in the UEFA uh, Conference League, I think, at one point as well. So they've been involved in certain things as well. So, yeah, it's... Uh, Certainly in, in the prelim of these rounds as well. So great for him to get that opportunity. Uh, Marty, I guess we'll end with your thoughts on Easton going out there. And uh, I guess it's watch this space, is it not, for FC Eddie fans? It most certainly is. Yeah, again, it's, it, it is a top tier in Europe, right? This is, this is a big um, accomplishment for him. And yeah, I mean, I, I know you mentioned that he grew a little bit last season, totally saw that. And, and again, his, his consistency as a goal scorer for, in the Canadian Premier League is, is undeniable. And uh, as we were talking earlier today, I believe he will be at some point in the new FIFA game. So I'll be trying to pick him up on Ultimate Team and trying to create a new meta. Maybe if maybe maybe his heading stats are going to be like 99. We'll have to see. Maybe I can oh, just destroy go. a bunch of kids online. There you go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I can't talk about FIFA without watching you guys playing FIFA during our Christmas uh, get-togethers and uh, me, me just getting destroyed, you know, my first <laughs> FIFA games for many years. But I don't care anymore because you can put Phil Coutinho at Villa and it's real. Right, Charlie? There we Coutinho, go. Luca Dean is there exactly. as well now, apparently. It's all, uh, it's, all, it's all going great. Had to get that in there. <laughs> all right. And on that bombshell, we will finish on the, the, the great season that we've had so far on this podcast. Because it's number one. Hopefully you enjoyed it because uh, we're back in 2022. Uh, we'll be back probably within the next week or so to put more news. And then, of course, get you ready for the Canadian. Uh, wow, what a window that's going to be. Honduras away, USA at home, El Salvador away. Uh, games 9, 10, and 11 in the CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers. We get close to wrapping up the 14 in March. And a reminder, U Sports Draft, that's right, 16 players to be drafted and uh, start their journey as an exciting professional player in the Canadian Premier League next Thursday, the 20th at 8 p.m. As well, we'll have that for all of you across all platforms. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks to Bobby Spiniosis, to Alessandro Hajadipur, and to Taryn Campbell, to Charlie and Marty. Thank you, and we'll speak to you all soon. God bless. Take care of each other.